We are indeed blessed to live in the time that we live in. I know it sounds a little strange with everything going haywire, but we have an opportunity that we may see Jesus break the clouds. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to experience? But it's one of those experiences like we had before. We were talking about before with Josh, we were Joseph, that you got to be Joseph in prison before you can be Joseph in Egypt. And so before we can see the glorious coming of our Savior, we might have to go through some prison experiences. Amen. But whatever it happens, we're definitely going to have to go through a converting of soul, our soul. Amen. Now, and we, because we live in this time, uh, there is something that is absolute. And we want to read this absolute thing that is happening and that we might not be aware of, but we might want to understand the time that we live in and the two forces that are at work at this time. So we're going to go to the book of Revelation chapter 14 this morning to start because there is a reality in Revelation 14 and then there's a reality in Revelation 13 and they both speak of the same incident. But we have to be aware that this is happening because we're going to have to make a decision about who we're going to be loyal to and who we're going to honor in all that we do. So Revelation chapter 14, <clears throat> let's begin at verse 9 if we will. Revelation 14, verse 9. And it says, And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now this should... Uh, encourage us not to do what? To worship the beast and his image. Amen? Why? Because the end of that thing is going to be death. Amen? All right, let's go to Revelation 13. Because the beast is speaking in Revelation 13. Now, it says in Revelation 13, verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which we had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword, a sword, and did live. And he, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Oh. The same thing is happening, uh, spoken of from two different sides. Somebody is going, you're going to die or you're going to die. Isn't that a wonderful thing to understand? Death is in your future. Can we say amen to that? Amen. But are we going to have eternal death? Are we going to have temporary death? But first thing first, if we are going to have eternal death, there must be a certain type of death that must happen to us right now. We must die to self if we're going to be a partaker of the great and glorious gifts that God wants us to have. Because when we're sitting here in this last hour that the image says, I'm going to kill you. And God says, if you worship the image, you got to go. There's a choice to make. And we need to be educated about the choice that we're going to make. And we pray that we will not be moved from our faith when the beast comes at you. You know that's what's happening now, don't you? They got this one guy going around all these religions. He wears this little pointy hat. It's really interesting. He goes around and talks to people, and he's gathering all the religions of the earth so they may be one. Amen? Well. Now, he hadn't come by here. <laughs> and it's just a matter of time. Because everyone is going to have to be on the same page. Because the Tower of Babel is real. And they're going to bring it all together. And this religion thing is very important. How, if you, I haven't been on this, I've been on this earth more than half a century. And I've seen things change in the last 20 years I didn't think would ever happen in the history of earth. I would never think this would be going on with, with this one world religion now. I would never think I would see the, uh, 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 the charismatics join hand with the Catholics. And, but I knew it was going to happen because God said it was going to happen. Amen. Amen? But it's happening right now. And, 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 and so when, when this thing comes together, 
you're going to, and I have to make a decision. Are we going to go along with it for peace sake? Or are we going to be loyal to our God? And this is the question that we're going to have to answer. And each individual has to answer that question between themselves and their God. And this is, we see the result. The result is this. You're going to either die eternally or they're going to come at you and try to kill you. What are we prepared to to face this morning? Go to Matthew. Christ helped us out. Christ knew this was going to happen, so he helped us out. He started telling us some things that we need to look for. And he said, look, here's to help you make this proper decision. Christ told us something in the book of Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10. And we we'll start at verse 26. Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to read verse, uh, start at verse 26. Matthew 10, verse 26 says, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach you upon the housetops. He said, look, I'm going to give you something to tell people that the world's not going to understand, but I want you to tell it anyway. Because when we get to the point where we can't teach the word of God, we're going to have to make, I mean, teach the word of God and not be harassed by the church. It's going to be a problem. And we're going to have to make a decision if we're going to go on and continue to do what God asked us to do. And Jesus was saying, look, I'm going to tell you some things and I want you to preach it from the housetops. But verse 28, he said, and fear not them which do what? So, But how can we be in that position? None of us are there yet. Someone came in here and said, look, all you have to do is close that book and walk out of here. Or if you keep reading that book, we're going to take you out. What would you do? I know what we would love to say we would do. We would say, oh, well, we're going to die for Jesus. You have never faced that in your life. You've never had that cold steel pressed to the top of your head. You've never had somebody hold your child with a gun next to its head, have you? See, we got some growing up to do in, the, in, in this. And God knows that. God is a great God. I'm so glad he didn't do that this morning because I don't know who, would, who, who could stand. Amen. But God is a merciful God. But he said, look, and fear them not which kill the body, but are not able to kill the what? Soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He said, I don't want you to, when he says fear, what is he talking about? He said, don't respect, don't honor, don't reverence them that can only kill the body. Reverence those who have the power over the soul and the body. Now, who has power over the soul and the body? So our fear, our reverence, our honor should be who? To God. To God. Amen. Amen. He said, because it's really all about the soul anyway. He said, this thing is temporary at best. At best it is. Now, let's say Jesus delays his coming. You know, in our estimation, delays his coming. A hundred years from now, will you be here? No, probably not. Probably not. not. Y'all be some old folks. (laughs) But this decision that we're making this morning still has to be made whether Jesus breaks the cloud or not. Are you going to serve him or are you going to serve this beast in his image? Or serve the enemy of God, which is Satan himself. If you've chosen Jesus, because we all here saying we've chose to serve the Lord, where is his honor? Are we honoring him in what we do? Are we, we are loyal to him no matter what the circumstance. We talked about this this morning with jo- Joseph. He was loyal to God. No matter if he was in prison or in a pit or in a king's palace, he was loyal to God. God is asking this question this morning, where is his honor? Go to Malachi chapter 1, if you would. Where is his honor? If we are Christians, where is his honor? It almost makes you not want to say Christian. Why? Because the definition is it's been so skewed that everybody wants to be in this great big pile of Christianity. When you find out that Christianity is not the following of Christ, it's the following of a strange doctrine in this last day. That's why everybody can sit at the same table. How can you, how how can I sit at a table, a religious table, with someone who denies the divinity of Jesus? 
Isn't that the whole thing? You know, being the son of God, being the redeemer, and you tell me he didn't exist or you tell me he was just a prophet. What can I talk to you about? If, I tell, if I'm sitting at the, another uh, person who doesn't even believe in any of that, they believe in the universal nature of man and the, and the universe talks to each other and the plants and the trees are God. How can I sit at the table and talk religion with this person? But all this is being lumped into one little nice little bow. The Beatles put a song out. I know that's maybe showing my age. In the 60s, it says, all we need is love. Da, 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 da. Yep, yep, no. All we need is love, because love is all we need. Oh, y'all didn't hear that. What are they saying today? All we need is love. It's too bad it's not God. The definition of love is what? God. God is love. They're saying all we need is to be able to just coexist and get along. And you know, those, those people who won't do that, they are mean and they are evil. And we'll have to do something about those people. That day is here now. It's here. It used to be we waited for that day, but it's here now. If you're not part of a, of a sanctioned denomination, you know, those who have gone along with this process of the image and its beast, you're going to have a problem. That's why he said, if you're going to claim me, it's time now to honor me in all that you do, because it's going to get to a point where honoring Jesus and his word is going to become very difficult. But Malachi chapter 1, and that's not to scare you. That's to say, okay, here we go. That's to fortify you. That's to make you dig in and say, I'm with the Lord no matter what. Amen. But it's hard to be with something you don't know. And now, in the brief little moment we have, we need to get a great relationship with him now because we're going to need it, aren't we? Just like Joseph had. We're going to need it. If we have to go to prison, we're going to need Jesus. If we have to stand, and he said, shout it from the rooftops, we're going to need Jesus. We're going to need this relationship. And if we don't have this relationship, we're going to fail miserably, and we're going to end up worshiping the image and his beast. Chapter 1 of Malachi, verse 6. The Lord makes this statement. He says, a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer, what? Polluted bread upon my altar. See, if you, if you all who understand the sanctuary service and how the sacrificial services went back in the day, you couldn't bring a blemished offering. You, you would have to be a pure, a healthy, a, a, a proper offering. And, and God says, why are my priests bringing these, this, what do you call it, polluted bread? Now, polluted bread, why are they bringing this? And he said, upon my altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? He said, you're bringing things, you're, you're, you're saying you're a Christian, but you're not living Christianity. You are, you are bringing these, 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 these worldly definitions of love and these worldly definitions of, 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 of brotherhood, and, and then you're bringing that and, and trying to put that and claim that in my work. He said, you are offering the blind for sacrifice. Is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? We're bringing a lame offering to our God when we don't serve and honor him in all that we do. He's, and it's funny, he said, offer it now unto that governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? Think about that. We will bring to God things we won't bring to man. We honor and revere man more than we honor and revere God. But we always want to be claimed under the umbrella of Christianity. We need to understand that the definition of Christianity originally was those who follow the disciplines of Christ. Now, I don't know what the definition is, but you're going to find out very soon. Because as soon as you stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, they're going to say, hold, hold, hold on a second. We don't believe that now. It's like the people now don't understand why the Constitution has been rewritten and what they're about to drop. You know, on the secular side, that's the issue with people. But what about on your side? the side of your God. 
They're rewriting all of this for us. So we, we, we can't stay and say, well, it's, it is written. They're going to say, man, we don't even read that book anymore. And if you don't get with us, then we have to do something to you. Do you believe that's going to happen? Do you believe it's happening right now? And what's the only, the last country, and it hasn't really been sealed up, is where you live. It's everywhere else. Christianity can be sanctioned in any country as long as it goes through this channel. You have to believe in this and this and this and this. And, and when, when a guy got on television and said that uh, Luther's protest is over, is yours? I said, whoa, Luther. Y'all know the Martin Luther, don't you? Yes, right. It was 95, I believe it was. He had 95 issues with this church. They said they fixed one, therefore the protest is over. And since nobody knows the 95, and no one knows the word of God, oh yeah, we, we, it's all right, we're good. Because there's comfort in numbers, isn't it? Oh, we can just be part of this big old thing and everything will be all right. But you don't understand something. Even if you join this collaboration, the hand behind it. See, it's, it's going to be very temporary. In a sense that it's going to say, oh, we all just... Kumbaya, everything is beautiful and wonderful, but there's a spirit behind this thing that hates you, that wants to destroy, that is going to take it and, 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 and let him, he's going to show his hand just in a little while. So you can get to a point now where you can say, thus saith the Lord, or you can join them and lose your soul. What are we going to do this morning? And God says, the only way you'll have the fortitude to do this is if you start showing me honor and loyalty this morning. We have to be loyal to our God. Amen. And it's not hard to be loyal. He already spelled out what loyalty is. He already told us how to honor him. It's time now to do that. Everything that we do should honor our God. Joseph was the great example of that. Everything he did. The Hebrew boys, great examples of that. They said, we're going to honor our God no matter where or what is happening. We're about to go through this lion's den, and we don't know how to honor our God. And we don't know how to tap into that source that will keep those lion's mouths closed. Honor is expressed in loyalty. Go to Job chapter 13. Job was going through a few things. We do remember that, that guy, don't we? Job 13, if we would. It's expressed, honor is expressed through loyalty and trust. You can't be loyal to something you don't trust. God says, are you going to trust me now? Because you need to be loyal. You need to show me honor because we're about to go through a phase in this history of mankind that has never been before. And he needs some soldiers. He needs those that will stand in honor and, 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 and respect the general of souls. Job was going through something in Job 13. Let's begin at 13. That's 13, 13 of Job. Hold your peace. See, people were trying to give him some counsel. You know how people come and try to tell you, it's all right to do that. Don't worry about it. God don't, he, he don't require that. He said, hold on, hold your peace. Let me alone that I may speak and let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and, and put my life in my hand? He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's a statement. Do we have that much trust in Jesus? Though he slay me, I'll trust him. Think about that. I'll go to the grave trusting him. I said, Lord, but I thought you said you were going to bless me. I thought, he said, though he slay me, I'll trust him. That's when it's all, that's when you, this is gone. Flesh and blood, you don't care about this anymore. You said, Lord, if I have to put this down for you, it's all right with me. Though he slay me, I'll trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. For a hypocrite shall not come before him. See, a hypocrite has, can't make the statement, though he slay me. A hypocrite says, I believe in Jesus. Oh, it's getting a little rough. <clears throat> I think I'm going to go join the, the, the party, whatever they're going to call this thing. Oh, I don't know, Lord. I, I tell you what, Lord, I'm going to go infiltrate, you know. 
I'm going to get in here and sit for a little while. I'm going to still worship you, though. He said, a hypocrite won't come into the presence of God. See, this is real now. See, you all are born and living in a very real time. You can't fake this any longer. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna make you make a choice. And that's what's wonderful about it. See, because if they didn't make us make a choice, we would be vacillating all our lives. Well, you know, I'm, like we talked about this morning, I'm going to put on my religion this day, and I'm going to take off my religion this day, depending on the circumstance. Oh, they're not even going to let you do it. Satan won't let you do it. When you start joining his kingdom for real, I'm sorry, the beast and his image, that makes you feel better. When, when you start joining that thing for real, he's not going to let you go either. He requires everything. What he requires is mixed with hate and pain and misery and hardship. So all that, 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 that glitter that they got going right now about can we all get along, oh, this thing is, is, is a wicked, it's so wicked. And what we have to understand is our God requires all, but with him is joy, peace, mercy, long-suffering, grace, everything that it takes. This is what God is doing, and he wants that for us today. Now go to 2 Samuel. Loyalty to God is what we are needing. In today's society, no one is loyal because everybody's looking out for who? Themselves. Nobody's loyal. Nobody's loyal. You think you might be, let, let you get pressed just a little while, a little harder and see what happens. People used to be loyal to their church. Remember those days? And, and, and people used to be loyal to, uh, well, they, people, people used to be loyal to their pastors. And that's what got a whole lot of stuff in trouble. People weren't loyal in the, the, the God in the man. They were loyal to who? The man. And I'm going to tell you something about a man. For a piece of bread, a man will transgress. So if that's where your, your faith is in the human, oh, you, you just have to go for a nice little ride. But the God in the person is where your faith is. Amen? Amen. 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 Don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's God that your faith is in. It's God's order that your faith is in. It's in the power of God that your faith is in. That way, no matter what happens to the person, your faith is still in a good place, isn't it? Yes. Amen. I have lived that life. I've had my faith in a person. Won't do that again. As long as I live by God's grace and he gives me the, the, the ability to do so, I won't do that again. Amen. Amen. Now, was it the person's fault? No. no, it was my fault. So if you go get led down the road by some smooth-talking so-and-so, whose fault is it? Why? Because you didn't establish the honor and loyalty to the one that deserves the honor and loyalty, which is Christ. Go to 2 Samuel. There was a great, a great lesson learned in the loyalty of Uriah. Remember who Uriah was? Bathsheba's first husband. Bathsheba. But we won't get into that today. Because that's a story in itself. But 2 Samuel chapter 11. Loyalty. Honor. Is what God is looking for. And we're going to verse 6 of 2 Samuel 11. Stay with us just for a moment. We're, going to, we're reading this so we can understand what loyalty and honor is. It's not... Uh, 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 can, it, it, it doesn't matter what happens around you when you're loyal. It, it doesn't matter when your honor is to God. It doesn't matter what the circumstance is. Your number one priority is to honor him. Now, in verse 6 of 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Now, this was after what? David had gotten with Bathsheba and found out that Bathsheba was what? With child. With child. Oh, you're talking about a scandal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and David said, man, I'm going to use all my intelligence and smooth-talking ability because this can't happen. I'm the king of Israel, and I'm caught. 
He knew he was caught, too, because if he didn't think he was wrong, why did he start doing all of this other stuff? Now, he said, Joab, go, go, go get this guy. Verse 7, and when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. Oh, he was, hey, hey, how's it going, man? How's it going out there? I know you're out there fighting. You know, going to make him feel good and going to bring him close to him, right? Going to make him feel like, you, you my boy, man, you're doing all right. Think about how wicked that is. David now. David had wicked moments in his life. This was one of them. And David said, verse 8, to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Hey, man, you're so, here, take this with you. Go on home, man. You, you, you fought a good fight. You don't need to go out there no more. Not what was David trying to do. He was trying to get a cover-up going. He was trying, man, if he just go home, he'd been gone a long time, but if he go home and, 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 and spend the night, then whew, it's good. But look what loyalty will do. Verse 10, and when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house. No, verse 9, I'm sorry. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. Verse 10, and when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down into this house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from the, thy journey? And why then didn't, didst thou not go down into thy house? He said, you've been gone. I know you've been wanting to go home. What's the problem? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. You see where his loyalty was? He said, man, God's people, God's things, man, they don't have a house to go to. I, I can't go to my house. I'm looking on the things of others more than I look upon myself. He said, abide in tents in my Lord Joab and his servants of my Lord and, and, and encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? He said, I can't do that, man. We, I'm on my post. I'm loyal to the job at hand. Mm, mm, mm. I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, tarry here today also and tomorrow, and, I, and I'll let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and tomorrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him what? Drunk. drunk. He said, man, if I get him drunk, I know he'll go home. But loyalty and honor kept him true. And that even when he went out to lie on his bed with his servants of his Lord, but went what? Not down to his house. You see what honor will do? He honored his post. He got his assignment. He said, no, Israel, the ark, the God's, God's people are not where they should be. I can't be where I, can, I, I can, can't go home. Not until God's house is right. Man. Wouldn't we love to have a church full of people like this? Amen. So, oh, no, if God's house isn't right, man, I can't dwell in my sealed houses. And his house lay waste. He said, I, as mad as he wanted to go home and be with his wife, he said, man, my, tr my, my purpose is this, and I'm loyal to my purpose. Are we like that? We got to be like that. We need to say, Lord, to honor your name is priority number one. To live a life according to your word is priority number one. Everything else has to fit underneath that. And what's wonderful about it is when that does occur in your life, everything does fit under that. Everything does fall into place. All the things that you were striving and bucking and trying to get to, they all fall into place because God said, I got you. I take care of you. Remember he said in Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Honor him. He said, all these things will be added unto you. Are we willing to, are ready to honor our God with all that we have and all that we do? Because it's going to separate us from the rest of the world. And it's not going to be very comfortable sometimes to be separated, especially when you get separated and then persecuted. Yeah, we know that, right? Yes. Where in this Bible did God's people not get persecuted? 
when they were mingled with the other people. And who, was, who persecuted Jesus? The church. Why? Because he, he said, I have to honor my father. Man, I'm, let, me, let me show you what the true God is. Thus say of the Lord. That's all he could say. My father's house. My father. This is what my father told me. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that spirit kept talking about the father. And this is the kind of people you're going to have to be. And those are the kind of people that will be persecuted. But victory is sure, isn't it? Amen. Don't worry about it. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. You'll read in here that people died of an old age. So maybe you can read that and feel better. You know, people just died. They serve God and died. But we, you know, the devil have you focus on, they saw somebody in half. I don't want to do that, Lord. I don't want to honor you that much. What's the option? What is your option? Eternal death or e eternal life? Which one would you choose? What happens if eternal life comes with temporary passing away of flesh? Aren't you tired anyway? <laughs> Psalm 103. God says, I have a reward for those who honor me. And not because we are great people. Not because we have the great ability to, to honor him. He said, but I got a reward for them. Let's go to Psalm 103. The Lord says in verse 17 of Psalm 103. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Upon who? Fear him, meaning what? Respect, Respect reverence, honor. He said, from everlasting to everlasting, I'm with these people. And his righteousness unto who? Children's children. That makes me feel better because I'm not even a grandfather yet. But my God says, I'll cover them. Look at that. Before they're born, I'll cover them. Because what? You fear me. You honor me. Let's keep reading. To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember who? His commandments. For what purpose? To do them. See, you can remember that they exist, but that does you no good. He said to do them. So you see what's about to separate you from Christianity? Uh, please understand, I'm not talking about separating you from Christ. I'm talking about modern, maybe I should say modern day Christianity. Makes everybody feel better. Uh, you're about to get separated. Why? Because true Christians, of those who follow Christ, he said, will keep, will keep his covenant and will remember the commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments. What? You mean angels have to do this too? But the angels rejoice in doing it. Lord, tell me what to do. I can't wait to do it. They sit and wait on the command of God. How about us? We got a whole book of commands. We won't even open it. He said, hearkening unto the voice of the word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his host, ye ministers of his that do what? His pleasure. His pleasure. Oh, that shall be our testimony shortly. We'll be doing the pleasure of our God. Isn't that great? Don't you, aren't you excited about the possibility? Aren't you excited about the, 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 the opportunity to do the pleasure of God? What are we afraid of? That God's going to ask us to do something that's not good? Are we afraid of that? Our fear lies in the fact that we don't trust him yet. We trust our own little feeble hands and our own little feeble minds before we trust the infinite and almighty God. God, you're going to take this from me. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do this. If God took something from you, guess what? It was for your betterment. All God wants to remove from your life is sin. That's it. And then not only does he, he doesn't leave a big gaping hole, does he? He fills it with joy. He fills it with peace. He fills it with love and he fills it with power. We got to overcome now. This is the time now. We are living in the time where we're going to have to make this decision. This big decision cannot be made until we daily make the decision with our God. Go to Mark 8.
And this is where it starts. We touched just a little bit on the time that we live in. We touched a little bit on the enemy that is coming. We, we showed you by God's grace how it's coming, who is it coming through, and, and, and that's all okay. But this is where it starts. Mark chapter 8. Let's go to verse 34. Mark 8, 34. He said, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, what's the first thing they have to do? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and what? Follow me. This is the most difficult thing for humans to do, to deny self. People are going through this, this, this de false denial period now. They call it Lent. Oh, don't let, don't let me get started on that. <clears throat> That's just the most bizarre thing I've ever heard of. Why, somebody who believes in Christ would participate in that. <clears throat> that just, anyway. <laughs> Um, but there's this, this false sacrifice that's going on even now. But God says, I need you to deny yourself. You know how difficult that is? If I ask you right now not to eat for three days, how would we fare? If we did make it through, we would be murmuring and complaining, looking for sundown that last day. We have to learn to deny ourselves. What else do we do that we know that God is not pleased with? Deny that. Stop it. Are we fighting that battle? What, what, what my favorite thing to talk about, besides Doritos, <laughs> is won't you deny yourself something that you like that's questionable? Anybody have a food that they think is questionable they shouldn't be eating? Because even the, the man with the white coat told you not to. See, the man with the white coat tells you to eat something. Well, you know that might be right. <laughs> but when Jesus said, your body is the temple, shouldn't that be enough? You know, for the, the, the paydays, and they have paydays anymore? Uh, 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 what else? The hostess cupcakes. They got those? How about the, the hostess fruit pie? Oh, none of y'all know? Oh, good. Y'all just so healthy people. Wonderful. <laughs> well, those are things that I used to like. Those are things I could not help. I, man, I got to have that. And when I first started hearing about the Lord said, you know, don't kill yourself. Suicide is a sin. He said, you might want to leave that alone. He said, go find out what that's in that. I said, Lord, man, Pop-Tarts. We ever ate a, anybody ever ate a, bought a box of Pop Tarts before? Yeah. Anybody ever ate just one Pop Tart? Mm. It's not designed for that. <laughs> they put two in a packet. <laughs> they ain't mess around, put three packages in a box. And depending how long you plan to sit is how many Pop Tarts you're going to eat. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Well, one day, some years ago, I looked at the box of Pop this is when I started looking at, you know how you see calories per serving? Uh -huh. Then I started looking at what they considered a serving. <laughs> see, to me, it's a box. <laughs> Six Pop-Tarts is a serving. <laughs> <laughs> but I started looking at that, and it says one Pop-Tart was a serving, not one package, and it had 500 calories in it. And this is when I started to work, you know, this is... But yeah, what? A while back, working out, work out. Do you know how long it takes to burn 500 calories? I said, I don't feel like going through that much work. I'm done with that. And God said, Keep doing that. Keep finding the things I ask you not to do that you're actively doing, and I'll give you help to overcome it. Well, that's not just in that. That's in all parts of our lives. And this is where honoring God is is coming into play now. We have to learn to honor Him in everything that we do. And if we have questions about what God asks us, pray, have a relationship with him. He'll show it to you. And that's what's wonderful about it. God will do this for you. We're living witness that he does. I don't do a whole lot of things, not because I'm holy. It's because my God helped me. And the more God is in you, the more you'll resemble God. 
the more you will resemble what the Holy Ghost does. Does the Holy Ghost go to the casino? No. You sure? He'd probably win every time, wouldn't he? Well, if the Holy Ghost is in you, will you be down there? Okay. See, just that kind of stuff. I know none of y'all do any of that, but I'm trying to show some examples that nobody in here will get offended. Let's keep reading. God said, let him deny himself. Verse 35 says, for whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall do what? Save it. Isn't that self-preservation that first thing we have to deal with? We're designed to, to survive on our own merits and our own abilities. God says, look, if you lose your life for my sake, in other words, if you put yourself down for me, I will save you. He said, you'll have your life, and you'll have it more abundantly. He said, uh, verse 36, for what shall a man profit? Shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So all of these things that we're doing to preserve ourselves and our way of life, all those 15 jobs that we have, all those things that we're stealing from, all, all this stuff so we can have a certain type of life. He said, even if you got everything that you've been working for, and you lose your soul, what's your profit? Nothing. Nothing. He said, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whos whoever, whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be what? Ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now look, this is where we are. We have to get over self. We got to take up our cross and we have to walk in the way God asks us to walk because if we don't, we are ashamed of God. And Jesus said, man, if you're ashamed of me, do we need God to, Jesus to represent us in the most holy place? We need, a, we need him not to be ashamed of him. We need him to call our name before the Father. So we should be calling his name here on earth. And by calling his name, what we mean is honoring him and reverencing him, and not being afraid that we're going to lose our life for standing up for thus saith the Lord. Are we ready for that? Go to Daniel. Daniel did this. Daniel did this in a way that we're going to have to do it. And Daniel didn't start with the lion's den, did he? Daniel showed up in Babylon with a conviction that they hadn't seen before. They took the best and the brightest of the slave, made them slaves, and they brought them uh, to the prince of the eunuchs. And he already was convinced, I don't care what you say. I will never shame my God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Is that our testimony? Yeah. When Jesus says, thou shall or thou shall not, do we say that? Or we say, well, you know, they ain't ready for that yet. <laughs> or I'm not ready for the repercussions. You know, if I say something, they're going to let me go. Nobody's been there, but you will be. Daniel chapter 6. You'll be surprised. It's going to get a little tighter, y'all. Okay? A little tighter. You won't be able to go into your job and say, I don't work on Sabbath. They're going to say, oh, you don't work here. That's going to happen. See, and you're going to, you, you're going to be saying, well, well, what church do you go to? Oh, they're not on our list. See, all of these things are about to happen. Do you know they're passing legislation that there'll be no religious exemptions for immunization? Wow. And you'll have the same frustration as Sister Jerry had. What are you going to do? Are you going to stand? See, you're going to find out what you believe and what you don't believe. Some people believe as a matter of convenience. But when that pressure gets on you, you'll find out what you believe. And you'll find out what you'll stand. And you'll find out what you want to give up for the Lord. If you, that's why all your belief must be based where? In the scriptures. Don't have a belief based on what somebody told you. Or where, you know, five out of ten people say this. Find it in here because this is, if you stand here, you're going to be all right. And don't stand somewhere else and try to bring this to it. Let's keep going. 
We're in the sixth chapter of Daniel. Daniel took a stand. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Verse 19 said, then the king arose very early in the morning. Why? See, the king got tricked, <laughs> but the king loved Daniel. And so he couldn't sleep. He kept walking around all day. He said, man, all night, I don't want anything to eat. Don't play any music, man. Because uh, I remember Daniel, he told me something. I know I, I see him fast. I see him pray. And that's how he gets to talk to his God. I, I, I just, I, I'm just going to, I don't know what to do. Verse 19 said, then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, look what he said. He cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, oh, Daniel, servant of what? See, reverence will do this to you. When you reverence the God, everybody will know who you are. And everybody will do more importantly, know what? who their God is. He said, servant of, of the living God, is thy God whom thou what? Service continually. That's what's the character of Daniel. This must be our character. Continually. Everywhere you go, serve him. And the king saw that. It's always so important to be Daniel, especially when you're in a high-ranking position. Be Daniel. So the king can see it. So the king will have an opportunity. So the people around will have the opportunity to see somebody who serves their God continually. He said, that, well, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. He was hoping, wasn't he? He really wanted Daniel. He said, man, I don't want to lose Daniel. Oh, some junk. He did. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God, has sent his angel. You believe that? That's what happened to Daniel, and that's what's going to happen to you. God will send his angel. We got to believe that. He said, God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me for as much what? As before him, innocency was found in me. In other words, I honored him. I didn't do anything against him. I didn't do anything to dishonor my God. So innocent, innocency was found in me by him. And also what? He said, and also before thee, O king. King, I didn't do you wrong either. Mm -hmm. right. And the king knew that because the king knew he got tricked. Mm -hmm. But old Daniel's character, which started when he was a little boy, was on display now. It was so powerful that his connection with the almighty God kept the lions from devouring him. And in verse 23, then was the king, what? Exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him. Why? Because he believed in his God. Do you see what belief is now? To be living, to live under the statutes and commandments of God. Daniel did that because he said, though he slay me, though I go to the lion's den, I'll trust him. If the lions had devoured Daniel, would it have been all right? It would have been all right. Daniel wouldn't have cared. Man, at least I don't have to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to sleep and wait on my turn. But Daniel was true. Daniel was loyal, and he honored his God, and God honored him. How do you show your loyalty? Are we going to be all right? Amen. Go to 1 Peter. We're going to get out of here in just a moment. How are we going to show our loyalty to our God? We know it's important. We know it's necessary. But how do we do it? Do we just sit in the room and, um, we are on display, people. And that's what's good. You want a job? Take this job. You on display 24-7. When you slip, oh, they make sure you're on television. But we're going to be loyal to our God. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, stay with us just a moment. We're going to start at verse 8. You want to be loyal to God? Here's some instructions. We ready? 1 Peter 3, let's start at 8. Finally, 
be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be what? Pitiful. Be courteous. That's a start, isn't it? Why? Because that's the character of Christ. Start there. Let's keep going. Not rendering evil for evil. Can we do that? Why? Because that's the character of Christ. He said, this is how you honor me, by being Christians. Evil for evil. What does that mean? If somebody says something to you, what do you do? I'm going to get him. How, how, many, how, how many times have you been at the office? Somebody comes up to you and, and, and well, you know, and just, I mean, just pushing every button they can push on you. And they just, they just watch you jump them down. They come to work. The Satan has put in their heart to come to work just to make sure you're not a Christian today. <laughs> Don't you think you're being tested and tried? Mm -hmm. And what's sad about it, it's not just you losing your soul. It's those who are watching you because you've been running your mouth about Jesus. I'm a Christian. Yes, the Lord is good. Praise him. Remember all those things y'all do at the office? And then Satan comes in when his agents comes in and pushes a button on you. And the next thing you know, you, got, you sound like a sailor. Now look here, you got to know this. You know how you get your head gone moving and all this? <laughs> and all of a sudden, everything you've ever said, even though it might have been right, is thrown in the garbage. You have misrepresented your God. And now that blood is on your hand. Oh, be careful what you, what you say. Always be prayerful. When you see the agents of Satan coming, what should you do? Pray, Pray fervently. Lord, what would you want me to do? Hide me behind the shadow of the Almighty. Help me. Put me in the cleft of the rock, something, because I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm weak, Lord. And guess what will happen? He'll do things that you didn't think. Your stuff will come out of your mouth that you didn't even know existed. Talking about, well, it's okay. Ah, uh, well, no, it didn't really happen that way, but let's sit down and talk about it. Because what you thought you were going to say is, I'm going to cut them. I'm going to make sure they lose their job. You know, you start planning this great, great elaborate scheme on how you're going to get them. God says, you don't render evil for evil. That's how you honor me. Amen. Let's keep reading. Maybe, maybe we'll find us in here somewhere. Or oh, railing for railing, but contrawise blessing. He said, bless those people who are doing evil to you. Did Christ do that? Yes. That's how you honor him. Knowing, what? That ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. He said, man, they can't take your blessing from you. But boy, we let them rent space in our brain, don't we? We should be thinking about our Lord and Savior. We're thinking about how, uh, I can't stand them people. If you can't stand them, why are you letting them? They don't even pay rent in your brain. They just sit there for free. Let it go. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak what? No guile. Let him excuse evil and do good. And let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that what? Do evil. So if you render evil for evil, the face of the Lord is against you and against me. Is that right? Can we, we, we are with that. And verse 13 says, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? They can't do but so much. They can't do anything unless God gives them permission. Amen. That's how you can stand and trust him. That's why Daniel could go to that lion's den, because he understood nothing can happen to me unless my father says it's okay. Why? Because I trusted him. I stood for him because I didn't want to dishonor him. I'd rather go to this lion's den than dishonor my God. Are we like that? Now let's go to 13. He said, if you follow that are good. Verse 14, but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. 
Can we say amen? amen? We should be, oh yeah, happy are we. We are suffering for righteousness sake. We ain't there yet, huh? Okay, let's keep reading. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Don't worry about them. Don't worry about what they can do to you. Because God said, but sanctify the Lord God where? In your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man and ask if you a reason of the hope that is, with, that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that where, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. What happened to those guys that tricked the king into throwing a, a Daniel in the, in the lion's den? Uh, I think it said they may be ashamed. Wouldn't you say that was a shameful position once their kids and everybody was thrown in that lion's den? God says, I got your revenge. Don't worry about it. Didn't he say vengeance is mine? He said, let me repay. I got this. But see, God will repay in a way to try to save them. See, God didn't want to kick them to the curb like we want to kick them to the curb. God didn't want to counsel them like we want to counsel them. He said, I'm trying to save them, but I need somebody to stand for the right so they may be able to see it. So you want to know how to honor God. Read 1 Peter 3 again. And that's a start. That's not the end. That's a start. And we're going to go on from faith to faith. And we're going to learn to trust it. And we're going to learn to be, to be those, 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 those great servants that stand for the right no matter what. What a glorious day that's going to be. And yet God's going to have a people. Are you going to be that people? Yes. You can say yes and be confident that God is able to perform the doing of it. Because when they come, well, when they continue to come, because they've been coming a while, and the agents of Satan have been around a long time, and they've been in your head talking to you, saying it's okay, don't worry about it. What happens if the, if the whole world decides they're going to be a one religion? Then what would you do? I think I'll owe my book to Revelation 13. It said the whole world wandered after the beast. So I said, oh, well, I know I don't want to go with that. Well, Lord, teach me what to do. But our, see, we're not at, God is not calling every one of you to go stand before Congress. He didn't call but one Moses. But there was a whole lot of people involved, was it not? Amen. And everybody was important. Now, Moses stood there because Moses had been through some things. Joseph stood before Pharaoh because Joseph was, was faithful in prison. Let us all get our faithful prison thing going on today. You know, we're all oppressed and everything is terrible. Let's try to be faithful now because he has some things he wants us to do that are, are great things. But he has to know he can trust you. He has to know he can, you can, you're going to honor him no matter what. Because think about it. Oh, I'm good and faithful, broke. It was easy to be a Christian when things are going bad. We talked about this this morning. We got to go. Most of our relationships with Christ are based on hard times. What a terrible thing to do. Then you don't even know him when things are good. When God pulls you out of the ditch, you forget. God says, I want you to live up here. I, I want you to live on the penthouse floor. I want you to live up here. But you don't know how to act up here. I don't want you to lose your soul. Something. You're not going up here. You do well down here. And I want your soul. I want you to live with me. And if I have to put, keep you there all your life so you'll have eternal life, guess what he'll do? So let's go ahead and try to come out of the basement. Let's be obedient here so we can be obedient here. And as we go, 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 we'll be more obedient to our God.